journeys. They can take us anywhere and connect us with everyone. Different journeys, different purposes, different roads, different destinations. They can cover any distance, reaching any place. They embody hope and foster connections. Journeys possess the power to transform individuals like nothing else can. Once upon a time, I got to a point in my life where I was finally willing to die for something. The only problem was, I didn't realise that it would nearly cost me my life 11 times over in the space of just 19 months. I am Sam and I'll be your host. Sam Clear is an adventurous soul, a passionate wanderer who traverses the world for the mission. I've always loved adventure, but nothing really could have prepared me for what I was about to face to face with the walk around the world for unity. He explores new lands, balancing on the precipice between thrill and peril, driven by unwavering faith. When faced with a choice, he always takes the road less traveled. His journey endures, seeking unity and harmony. I was looking at a world map and thought, how awesome would it be to, to walk around the world? And in December of 2006, and I started walking from the easternmost point of Brazil, trying to make my way to Spain. A 15,600 kilometre journey, but to stop in every single church I pass along the way, regardless of denomination, and humbly inviting them to please pray for unity. Over the next 12 episodes, we're going to be unpacking some of the significant lessons that I learnt through that 19 month period. When I was younger, I was always aware of the disunity of the church. It was one of those things I just didn't necessarily care about and if anything felt very disassociated from. It was an issue that belonged to others. But after graduating from my degree in mechanical engineering, I was then at a point where I was in love with the idea of putting my faith into action, just in doing something. I was particularly in love with the idea of going to Africa, being a missionary, volunteering as an engineer. Well, I ended up in Sydney, in New South Wales, working as a missionary with youth. I chose that simply because I didn't have a skill set for it. And I was gonna to have to rely on God and the lifestyle they lived, which was Youth Mission Team Australia with the Disciples of Jesus community, 
was something that was going to stretch me. During those four years li living in Adelaide and Melbourne, I became very aware of the disunity of the church in that I was being invited into meetings as either, either a Catholic representative or as someone who worked with teenagers. But again and again, those meetings would descend into playground fights. They would find out where each other went to church, what organisation they were involved with, what political group they were associated with. And they'd just start arguing one after the other. As an example, I was in a meeting in Melbourne where halfway through it, they had agreed with what I just said, which prompted one guy to ask the question, oh, where do you go to church? And when I said, I go to the Catholic church up the road, there was dead silence. And then that guy turned to the guy running the meeting and asked him, sorry, what's he doing here? Pointing to me. He said, I thought this was just gonna be Christians today. Catholics don't believe in Jesus. They aren't Christian. They had a quick conversation. The guy running the meeting leant forward, apologised to me and asked me to leave. They would not continue the meeting until the Catholic had left the room. The next meeting I went to was a different group of people working on a different project, but this time the Baptists and the Pentecostals began throwing their Bibles across the table at each other, accusing each other of not being proper Christians, but asking me to back them up. I was getting really upset with what was happening, but this was the state of the church. And a lot of the issues that people were arguing over were really important. I saw very little ground being made. And a lot of the time what was happening was people were saying, well, I know that I am right. And this group of people over here, well, obviously they are wrong. And then they'd be telling everyone else how wrong they were. And then that group of people were saying, well, obviously we are right and they are wrong and they'd be telling everyone else why they are wrong. And this would go round and round in circles. Perhaps from an engineering perspective, the lack of efficiency towards actually being united completely. <sighs> what I could do though was pray. And I began to pray for unity from that moment on. It was almost like this light bulb moment going off, as simplistic as it was that that should have been my first foundational point anyway. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. End, amen. I began to invite some of my friends to pray for unity, but a lot refused to. They'd say things like, no, no, we'll be united when people join our church or we'll be united when everyone reads their Bible properly. We'll be united when they read the early church fathers. We'll be united when they receive the Holy Spirit. Now, there are plenty of times when I actually agreed with what people were saying, but again, it wasn't producing any fruit. There actually wasn't an openness to bridging the gap unless the other side came to them, at which point there was almost this triumphant party of, yeah, we always knew we were right, welcome to us. How do you bridge that gap? How do you unite as family again? In truth and in love. My two great loves combined. My sadness at the disunity of the church and my other great love, adventure. I've grown up having great adventures. I was looking at a world map and thought, how awesome would it be to do what St. Francis of Assisi did? To sell everything that I own, sell my Land Rover Discovery, and then start walking, and whether you want to call it a protest walk or a promotional walk for unity, to walk around the world. And in December of 2006, I sold up, I packed up, and I started walking from Joa Pessoa, 
the easternmost point of Brazil, trying to make my way to Spain, to Cape Finisterre, the westernmost point of mainland Europe. A 15,600 kilometre journey, walking up to people's door, knocking on it, and having a face-to-face -face conversation, and humbly inviting them to please pray for unity. The mission was very simple. Pray for unity, stop at every church I passed along the way and invite them to pray for each other as a foundation, as a starting point. It's not gonna fix disunity, but it is the ultimate foundation. Invite God into that brokenness. This has been probably one of the longest days of the entire trip since leaving Brazil. Uh, it is a quarter past four in the morning. The sun isn't too far off. Uh, I've walked about 73, I think, 73 kilometres. Uh, I am a little bit beyond tired. Uh, I finally made it to a motel. That was the only problem. There was just no accommodation. I just had to keep on walking. So. The journey itself, we took over a year to plan it. Back in 2006, Google Maps wasn't available. I had to go and buy paper maps for all of these countries around the world. I had five people helping me to put the journey together. So I'm running on empty big time. My stomach's turning itself inside out. But other than that, my body's actually feeling okay considering this is kilometre 80 and it's 2.30 in the morning. And began walking from Joa Pessoa through Brazil, up through South America, Central America, North America to Edmonton in Canada, then flew across the Bay Ring Strait into Vladivostok. I took the train through Siberia. It was the middle of winter. We're averaging minus 40 degrees Celsius, and that was their daytime temperature. And then from Moscow, start walking again, which is still cold enough in the middle of winter, down through the rest of Russia, down through Belarus, the last remaining dictatorship of Europe, I was arrested there by the KGB, the secret police, taken into interrogation. In the end, they just asked for a bribe. They were actually quite enthralled with what I was doing and they encouraged me on the journey and on I went. Down through Poland, Slovakia, Austria, over the Alps into Italy. It was springtime by then and beautiful. Down into Rome in the Vatican City, around the Mediterranean Sea, through Monte Carlo, southern France, over the Pyrenees Mountains and finished on the Camino de Santiago out across northern Spain to the westernmost point of mainland Europe, Cape Finisterre, which translates as Earth's end or the end of the Earth. 15,600 kilometres on foot. The journey was extremely difficult. I just got attacked by two blokes. That's uh, them up there. Shit, it's out of my gear. Come on. Who are they? They've snapped my poles. And they've broken my backpack. The execution of that mission, though, was exceedingly difficult. I was also there held at gunpoint on three occasions. It took a lot of negotiation to get his photograph afterwards once it had all calmed down and he no longer wanted to actually kill me. I was mugged at knife point by four men and stripped the count of everything that I owned. I was beaten up a number of times, including on the side of the road in Russia. Really scary stuff to wake up to. I also though, came face to face with a lot of dangerous animals. I was stung on my back by a scorpion. That stopped my heart beating multiple times over a half an hour period. I was uh, face to face with a puma in South America. I was struck at by a number of snakes. I had a, a big snake strike at me and the top of its head hit 
the bite of my leg full flight. I was also hospitalised quite a few times. I had salmonella poisoning, typhoid fever, food poisoning on four occasions. In Mexico, I trod in a hole and managed to dislodge my pelvic bones. I came home with post-traumatic stress disorder as a result. Please unite all Christians as one in truth and in love for the glory of your name and for the salvation of souls. The physical side of it, to a degree, I knew that that was going to be a big hurdle. What I wasn't prepared for was the hurdle of simply inviting people to pray for unity. As an example, I stopped at a particular church in Guatemala. I introduced myself to the minister there and invited him and his parish, his congregation, to pray for complete unity. And the minister just stared at me and, and in Spanish said, where do you go to church? Now that sent alarm bells going. I knew what that question meant. I didn't try to go around it though. I just said to him, I'm Catholic. And he said, ah, let's get religious then. Put his foot behind my feet, put his hand on my chest, and like a wrestling move, took my feet out from underneath me and pushed me onto my back onto the ground, took the wind out of me, called his mate over. And the two of them, while pushing my face into the dirt, prayed what I think was a prayer of exorcism over me. It was really difficult just to invite people to pray for unity because in most churches, there is a sense of what they believe is wrong. It took a lot of time to overcome that with people and to enter into dialogue just to get them to pray, to acknowledge that there are differences and there is a problem there. There are significant issues. The church is broken. Pray, pray for each other. Now crossing over the border into the United States. So after only just over 24 hours in Oklahoma, walking across the Panhandle, this is goodbye Oklahoma, and hello Colorado. The Gospel of John, chapter 17, is the longest prayer we have written down of Jesus, and it's all about unity. But Jesus prays specifically in verse 23 that those outside the church, when they look at the church, we would be so completely united that they would see God's love in action. They would witness the Father's love. And we know from a lot of people that is not what they see. In fact, there's a lot within the church. There are so many people I've met who are outside the church, who have been scandalised by disunity, who have been hurt, who look at the various beliefs. And I even have someone very close to me who says that they look at the church and all they see is people arguing. So why would they believe any of it? Like, it's almost as though you can believe anything you want. We live in, a, in an age at the moment where seeking truth is almost seen as a sin. Working towards unity is an incredibly difficult journey. And over the next episodes, we're going to look at the moments that broke me and the moments that inspired me. Will you please join me in prayer? Holy Father, Lord God, sorry for what we have done to the church. Please draw us back together as one, united completely, so that the world may know that you have loved them even as you have loved the Son. May we be united as you, Father, Son and Holy Spirit are united. Please draw us 
into truth, into full truth, and please help us to love courageously. It confused me as I walked across the road and it sunk in that it actually was my mum and dad, not just two people that looked like them. A strained Achilles tendon, my left leg, and on my right leg, my knees inflamed. Are you searching for purpose of life? <laughs> Discover your true identity. Stay tuned to Shalom World.